Welcome to twoquestions.tv. Stephen Wallace is back and we're talking about world-changing business. Welcome to twoquestions.tv. I'm Susan Barantini Mo. Joining me again today is Stephen Wallace, the founder and CEO of the Omen Heaney Co Cocoa Bean Company, the first company to sustain exports of the premium chocolate manufactured entirely in Africa and credited with producing the world's first single origin chocolate bar in 1994. He's also the author of this book, Obroni and the Chocolate Factory. You guys know this is one of my favorites for the year. Hi, Steve. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you, Susan. You know, when we talked before, we were talking strictly about your book, which I loved. And as, as we talked, you talked about, um, we talked about your love of Ghana, the country, and you mentioned Adam Smith, and you mentioned David Ricardo's idea of comparative advantage of international trade, and your dismay at the idea of globalism that has turned into kind of a bad thing with winners and losers. And at the time I thought, this is so interesting. I have to invite him back. And so let's talk about that idea that successful international trade doesn't necessitate winners and losers, despite what appears to have developed in you know, the last 40 and 50 years. Terrific, terrific. Right, I mean, we, we hearken back to these old uh, 18th century economists, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, and they, they talked about this notion of, of comparative advantage, which, all it means is you do what you do best and you trade for the rest. And if you pull it apart, what it really means is, is not every country is likely to be able to produce every product or good or service that they need, that, that trade is actually the most efficient or least expensive or fastest way to get the products and services you need. Um, and you know this has been borne out through the years. And somehow, um, you know, and, I, and People in the United States, I think, intuitively understood this. And in fact, it became the underpinnings for the Marshall Plan at the end of World War II when we talked about rebuilding Europe um, mm -hmm. um, and through trade, that we would engage with them, we'd help rebuild, we'd, we'd lend them or sell them or lease them goods, materials, and services and help rebuild them. And this would be not only good for the economy, me, which it turned out to be good for everybody's economy, Europe and the United States, but it also was a preventative for war. And it was um, after a world that had been weary of two world wars, you know, within the span of decades, I, people thought this idea of global engagement was actually a very good thing. At least it was global engagement around economic activity and cultural activity and not military activity. Uh, you know, we fast forward to 1990 in the Seattle World Trade Protest. In globalism, there was a jujitsu. It <laughs> became sort of a, a, a threatening notion right. in that globalism was this shorthand for um, a search for cheap labor. And that if your country, for example, Susan, um, could do something cheaper than mine, my workers in my country would be put out of business. Right. And it, was, it became sort of a very, what I thought, short-sighted and cabined, a very kind of sm small-minded view of what globalism was. And now to be sure, it, it displaced people. Right. And, and the remedies for what happens when people displaced is, is another discussion, and you can't ignore that. They're political, social, cultural implications, economic implications. So you can't just say, you know, let's, let's be insensitive to the, um, the tribulations that are an outcome of international trade. But, you know, it practiced in its best sense. And what intrigued me was uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, Ricardo called on us to articulate what it is that each country does best, and it's not easy. So, um, you, know, we, you know, maybe it's the quality of your education system that gives you a very trained workforce. Maybe it's artistic achievement. Maybe it's natural resources. Um, but the fact is that most countries can't do everything themselves as efficiently as possible. And, and you know, I've seen this in some, um, uh, it was at the World Economic Forum. And there were, at this point, it was the World Economic Forum on Africa. It was African countries. They were talking about food self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. And the fact was that there's some countries that are, say, desert. And that right. to be self-sufficient, you have to 
you irrigate, and then you have all these environmental problems of if you're moving water or, I mean, you know, from one place to another, or taking water rights from another country, that mm. then you have a military political problem. So some countries shouldn't grow their own rice, for example. Maybe they should pump their oil and buy their rice and import it, for example. So, mm -hmm. so certain subsidies that happen, we see it even, frankly, in the U.S. agricultural sphere, that there's subsidies for certain things because, you know, we want to employ and, and there's maybe a we want to employ local farmers, and there's perhaps a geopolitical reason that we don't want to be dependent on foreign countries. But we should all have our eyes wide open that there's probably a better, faster, cheaper way to get whatever good it is that we're, we're subsidizing from some trade partner in the world. Well, you, you've, you've talked about something interesting, this, um, this looking at, you know, everybody doing what they do best and and looking for ways for everybody to win and and i think when i think about this it, you know i'm not an economist i don't really understand it all <laughs> but but i you know when you talk about this sort of bipolar zero sum game that you know everybody you know some they're winners and losers and you know if if somebody is watching today and they have a business and, and they're intrigued by this notion. Do you, do you think this is something that has to be done from the genesis of a business or is it something that can be retrofitted sort of for lack of a better word? Um, it's an interesting question because uh, I think businesses can remake themselves mm -hmm. and with good leadership, good employees. You know, I'm very optimistic that all kinds of businesses can, but, but there's sort of short term costs. And, and I think that, the promise of globalism is over time writ large, an entire country, wealth is created. And if it's well proportioned among all the citizens or all the workers, then it's a sort of a happy ending. But you know, in the short term, because these trade deals and ours certainly was built on a partnership. Mm -hmm. And people can talk about, let's, let's look at our vendors as partners. And um, you know, it's, it's tossed around rather loosely. I mean, what that means is sometimes your partner lets you down, but that doesn't mean you <laughs> sue them or you take them to court or you drop them. I mean, what it means is in the short term, if you're serious about a long-term partnership, both sides have to forgive and forget, and you can't maximize every ac economic opportunity every day. Um, otherwise, it's not much of a partnership. That's practically um, un-American, Steve. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. I'm confused to this. Um, uh, well, yeah, but I, I think it's true. I mean, you know, when we think about how we behave with our neighbors and people there, there, and there's a lot of businesses, listen, there's a lot of family business, smaller businesses, and even some larger ones mm -hmm. where, you know, at the end of the day, you say, we're going to stick with you. You've got a great product or a service or a technology. You may not be ready for prime time today, but, you know, we will will be a partner with you and hopefully that loyalty, you know, will be paid back mm -hmm. to the other side of the table. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not that you do it just because you're simply kind and generous. It's because you're building a partnership that's going to weather economic storms and make you stronger and more competitive. So, um, you know, well, it engenders this component of, of perhaps generosity and niceness for lack of a better word. I mean, it is because we're trying to build a stronger economic model. We're trying to put, you know, all the feet on that stool on a, on a firm footing. And if everyone's worried about, are you going to bolt next week if something goes wrong or there's a price discrepancy or a mistake was made, you know, it doesn't engender a lot of loyalty. And I don't think you make progress, especially I, I would argue in some developing markets where the concept of rule of law and contract law and honoring a contract mm -hmm. is still sort of new. And, um, it's understood intellectually, but in a practical sense, you know, well, people will look at a piece of paper that's a contract and sort of, you know, well, it's, it's as good as the, the words written on it, but if circumstances change, we can sort of just get out of it. Right. And the fact is, in many countries, the legal system doesn't provide speedy or efficient recourse. So where, what do you do? You know, you're, you're left sort of empty handed. So I, is it possible to retrofit? It is, but it means you remake it. This isn't sort of a, a management fad du jour. Um, 
let's all create partnerships. Um, you know, and I sort of think back, there was a time when just-in-time inventory was all the rage. Mm. Well, what that meant is if you're a car manufacturer and you want a just-in-time inventory, your vendor of rear view mirrors would have to lay in more inventory. So it was ready to go at a moment's notice. Well, that costs them money. You know, so the prices would have to go up to just-in-time inventory may be efficient for you. You may expect cost concessions, but you might have to commit to a three or four or five or 10 year contract for a supplier to really play to a new set of ground rules. So I think inherent in all of this is trying to understand what the economic necessities of each party are. What do you really need to stay in business and to be a good partner? So you're not living sort of hand to mouth, but you have resources that you can negotiate, you know, the vagaries of, of business that come up all the time. Um, um, and, and that's kind of part of the partnership. So you realize both sides have to do well, well, um, but hopefully not gouge each other at the same time. Well, and I think you know, your book has some great examples of that, where this forging of a partnership, where you went through how many batches of, of chocolate before you actually got a good one that you liked? Yeah, um, more than I have fingers. Yes. <laughs> It was like years or something, but, but that you, that you stayed with it and you, and that was the thing that always struck me when I was reading the book and thinking about it after that you stayed with that partnership, you hung in there and kept saying, okay, well, let's try this and let's, and, and kept just kind of gently bringing them along. And I thought that was just so um, patient. And at the time I wasn't, I didn't quite understand how you could, you know, being very American, you know, and impatient myself, I couldn't, I practically couldn't comprehend the, the, the perseverance and the patience in, in that process. And now hearing you talk more about partnership, I recognize why and, and the wisdom underlying all of that. Not, and, and, and isn't it funny that this idea, this philosophy of building this solid partnership over time and staying in it through sort of thick and thin and all of that, it's a little bit like a marriage, let's be honest. Um, it, it's, it's, um, it also happens to be a nice, kind, generous way to be in the world. What a shock. Well, it is. Well, what a <laughs> shock. And, you know, you'd rather wake up in the morning and feel sort of excited to get to work and that not every negotiation has to have a winner or a loser. You're just kind of moving things forward. And uh, what I was doing, I think, was so unusual and unprecedented yeah. that I didn't have an exact timeline. I mean, it, if I did, I was disabused of that notion really early on. So I just realized <laughs> if you're going to do this, throw out the business plan and keep pushing forward. And you're happy to do it. And I had seen these sort of, these cringe inducing moments when I'd sit in a hotel in Ghana and I'd see some, some offshore consultants and they'd have say a, 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 a scroll of blueprints on the coffee table and there'd be these young Ghanaian engineers, you know, very earnest and, and following directions. And the, these foreign engineers or, or business people would be like pounding the table Pointing into these documents, berating the Ghanaians, and you know, not realizing, well, you, we don't have an electricity grid that always works 100% of the time 25 years ago. Right. And, and you know, a good rain will knock out water and sewage. I mean, all things that just happen, they happen in our country. And they're happening sure. in our country more increasingly. So I think you know, I saw this sort of impatience and this sort of, you know, it's smacked of the frankly, sort of a paternalism and a sort of like, uh, yes. you know, your, your country's not ready for prime time. And that, that sort of hurt because, you know, Ghana had a trajectory and, and it wasn't so many years ago, our country was an agrarian country. It was not a, an right. industrial powerhouse. Um, you can go back to probably all our grandparents. And if they didn't, they weren't immigrants, you know, they, they were living a pretty modest life. Um, in this country. So, um, you know, we're all, we all pass through that journey. Um, what's fascinating for me is both when I was a schoolboy in Ghana almost 40 years ago, and now I've sort of witnessed this modernization of a country that went from colonial times to a modern and, and very successful 
democracy, perhaps one of the most successful democracies on the whole African continent. So I was very lucky to see it. And, mm -hmm. and so I, these sort of situations where people belittled sort of a, a short-term frustration, you know, gave rise to this belittling, like something didn't work today. And, you know, it's every, somebody's fault and someone has to be yeah. a winner and a loser. And it's like, well, you're really serious about working here. I mean, you kind of almost want to say, well, anybody can come in and shout and yell yeah, and pound yeah. your fist on the table, but that's not going to win. You're not, you're not going to, you're not going to um, be successful. So uh, how clever a business person are you? Do you have patience or not? And, and one thing I learned in Ghana as a schoolboy was patience counts. And it, it wasn't an easy lesson to learn. No doubt. No doubt. Well, and, and I think that that you make a really excellent point. When when I think about people, whether it's whether it's in in business or you know folks who are going to do missionary work, um, I always think about it, you know it, it perhaps is wiser to let people tell you what they need and to immerse yourself in the culture and understand the culture so that you don't go in in this sort of paternalistic way. You don't go in sort of this, I am American, I know best kind of way and, and approach it in more of a, a fluid and dynamic, I need to understand the culture, I need to understand the people. Because not only do you risk being completely offensive, but, but you also risk not having strong partnerships. Well, I think that's exactly it. And, um, you know, whether you're there for a pro, for a for-profit mm -hmm. money-making venture, you're there um, for a non-profit or a charitable or eleemosynary venture, you know, venture, um, you've got a goal, you want to accomplish it, and you can't accomplish mm -hmm. any goals. That, I think if you're that impatient and that sort of tone deaf to the cultural um, pace of, of how things happen. And you know, it's easy to say there isn't a better way or a worse way. There's just, there's just ways and we all have to get yeah. fluent in how things are done around the world. Um, um, so that's, kind of, that's how I looked at it. And for me, it, w it was enjoyable. You know, I enjoyed, if it was a routine, if it had been very, I think, American-centric, you know, where I was certainly comfortable as a young lawyer working, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't as exciting and, and the adventure wasn't there to find myself in things like now what do I do this isn't where I, what you know was invigorating and, and you know for I think certain kinds of business people that's what you get up in the morning for that sort of right. excitement that sort of challenge and um, you know so well I got that in full measure yeah yeah wonderful uh, Steve it's always such a pleasure to talk to you thanks for being on the show today Susan, a pleasure. Um, and I wish you and your listeners well as always. Thank you so much. Thank you. Viewers, again, here's the book. Remember, this gets one of my highest recommendations for the year so far. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.